There was a big ram through my door, which woke me and my son up. They had Kevlar helmets with night vision, AR-15s with full body armor. There was military Humvees with machine gun mounts. I saw ATF out here, FBI, terrorist task force, local Dallas police. Had to be between 50 and 70 agents. Federal agent come and explain to me that the reason why they're arresting me was due to weapons. And I'm thinking like weapons of mass destruction, what type of weapons are you looking for? In the early morning hours of December 12th, 2017, former Marine and Black activist Christopher Daniels, AKA Rakim Balagoon, was arrested at his home for unlawful gun possession. So what would warrant such a dramatic arrest and a possible jail sentence of 10 years? According to a leaked FBI document, there's a new group of domestic terrorists, Black identity extremists. In May of 2018, a judge rejected the firearms charge and Rakim was released. We're currently at the prison where Rakim was held for the past six months, but he's just been freed. So we're gonna link up with him and learn more about what's going on. Hey man, how you doing, Rakim? Hey, good it's, to see you, it's man. It's good to see you, man. Yeah, welcome, welcome back, man. You know, it's good to be out, out here in the free world. You're the first potential case of a black identity extremist. How do you feel about that? This is when I found out I was on a terrorist watch list. My thing was like, wow, I would never know that I was gonna be the first person to be targeted. You know, I deal with mainly activists and people in the community who are regular working class people. Uh, how is this a threat to the government? I don't know. What's going on through your mind now? You know, people in your community have been calling you a political prisoner. There is a little bit of uh, frustration. You know, that's five to six months of my life that I can't get back. You know, right. I lost an apartment. I had a newborn daughter, as well as I have a 15-year-old son, 11-year-old son. And it has been a big impact on my family and finances. Good to see y'all as well. Oh, my. Rakim was greeted at home by family and members of Gorilla Mainframe, the black activist group that Rakim co founded. On their website, Gorilla Mainframe describes themselves as a community based political organization. Their activities include food drives, self-defense classes, weapons training, Contact. and open carry neighborhood patrols. It was these kinds of activities which are visible across Gorilla Mainframe and Rakim's social media accounts that Rakim believes made him a target of the FBI. Considering the politicized nature in which Rakim has been absent, can you guys speak about what's been going on within the organization? We knew what we wanted to do in terms of uh, making sure that he knows that people on the outside support him and also get his story out and expose the contradictions as best as we could. I'm just so happy. Uh, being that they offered him a plea bargain and he didn't take the plea bargain, that just shows dedication. He was able to endure what a lot of us, myself included, would have been broken. I mean, he's, he, he's the warrior. Rakim was living in this apartment complex when he was raided by the FBI in the middle of the night in December of 2017. Looking around, it's incredibly residential, so I can see that it would definitely make a scene and people would question why the FBI terror squad would be here in the middle of the night. We were forced to walk from this door out here, you know, come out like this, you know, stop, turn around walk backwards, and once we got here, put our hand behind our backs. They snatched me right out the way, like forcefully, and, and uh, handcuffed me. With all guns, you know, aimed on, on me. The FBI seized two firearms, along with a book called Negroes with Guns, a famous nonfiction work by civil rights activist Robert F. Franklin. The book was said to be a huge influence on Huey P. Newton, the founder of the Black Panthers. 
As events unfolded, Rakem discovered that he'd been under FBI surveillance for two years and that he'd be held without bond. They said I couldn't receive bond due to the fact that I was on social media, not empathizing with police officers who have been killed while um, in duty, and also due to a protest I did in Austin. Pretty much that as a whole, that, that makes me a threat to the community. Rakem's FBI surveillance began in March of 2015, after he participated in a protest against police brutality. The FBI learned about the protest from a video that was posted on the YouTube page for InfoWars, the far-right conspiracy theorist site run by Alex Jones. People were saying that the Black Panthers are out here doing an open carry march. Uh, so obviously we gotta go try and find these guys and of course see what the people out here at South by Southwest think about a bunch of guns in their face. Then separately, on July 7th, 2016, Micah X. Johnson opened fire on a group of police in Dallas and killed five officers. Dude, that's a cop down. Yeah, there's four cops down. On the one-year anniversary of the shootings, Rakim posted multiple times to Facebook expressing solidarity with Micah X. It baffles me, you know, to be put in the same categorization as people who run planes into the Twin Towers. Considering that you admired the tactics that Micah Johnson took against the police, would that would you say that's anything that Guerrilla Mainframe or yourself would actively do or pursue? No, with Guerrilla Mainframe, our goal is to educate the people, and we educate the people through political education. We believe in self-defense, but we don't believe in attacking the state because we feel that that's what the state wants you to do. Those statements that you put on Facebook, do you recognize why the police would take that as a threat against the state? No, I don't, because there has not been anything that I've done physically to, to say that I pose as a threat. My political opinion does not affect one law enforcement a agent or a police officer. On August 3rd, 2017, the FBI created the Black Identity Extremist Assessment, using the Dallas 2016 shooting and five other unrelated attacks on police as justification that this movement exists. Black identity extremists now considered a domestic terror threat by the FBI. According to the FBI assessment, it was very likely that these terrorists would target law enforcement officers in retaliation for perceived police violence against African Americans. Due to the assessment classifying the group as a domestic terror organization, the FBI is able to justify any invasive surveillance tactics used in monitoring these targeted individuals. Why is there an attack on black activists versus any reports dealing with the alt-right and the white nationalists? Can you answer that question quickly? I'm not Are you aware. Planning on investigating that. When was that report completed? In August of 2017. I'm not aware of. I have not studied that report. There's this perception that the government promotes that we are in a, uh, a stage of, of critical emergency because of terrorism. Mm -hmm. And that's because they get more power. And in order to retain that power, they need to find more terrorists. One of the most outspoken critics of the Black Identity Extremist Assessment is Michael German, a former FBI agent who did undercover work on white supremacists and right-wing militias in the 90s. He's now a fellow for the Brennan Center for Justice. What incentive do you believe that the FBI has to make a label like black identity extremist? A person cannot be targeted for investigation based solely on First Amendment activity. So by creating this black identity extremism movement, they can use that as the justification to then target any activist who, or any black person who is protesting police violence. One of my problems with this kind of, of intelligence report is these are six disparate acts of violence that they try to mold into a movement. There was really nothing connecting them except the fact that they killed police officers and the fact that they were black. They don't have shared ideologies. They are not associated with one another. They weren't part of the same groups. They weren't even in the same state and city in, for the most part. There is no such thing as the black identity movement. There's, I mean, I've never heard uh, Black Lives Matter activists refer to themselves as a black identity extremist, right? It's, it's sort of a made-up term 
that is used as an umbrella to cover anyone who is black and an activist, and really anyone who is black and has concerns about police violence or discrimination. They know that if they use this broad label, the police agencies receiving it will know who it applies to mm -hmm. and can make it basically apply to anyone they want. Why is this extremism um, being pushed throughout the FBI uh, on these minority groups? Any government sees protest against its own policies as threatening, right? That's a political threat, but it has an incentive to present that political threat as a security threat to the nation. This is a persistent problem. This is something that's happening now and has pretty much happened all along. Critics of the Black Identity Extremist label have drawn comparisons to COINTELPRO. COINTELPRO was a series of covert and at times illegal actions carried out by the FBI from 1956 to 1971. It was aimed at surveilling and disrupting domestic political organizations. They targeted the civil rights movement, Martin Luther King Jr. and the Black Panther Party. One day I was in the uh, city of Minneapolis library and I happened to be studying something on Malcolm X and I noticed that uh, there was always this man uh, that was behind me. So I just jumped up and I started going in and out of the library, you know, and he was trying to follow me, but, you know, I was a little too fast for him. One day, the same man came by my apartment where I live and knocked on the door and said, uh, uh, Mr. Crenshaw, we would like to talk to, I would like to talk to you. And that's when I sort of realized that the, uh, that the FBI was uh, targeting uh, me and, 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 and others. In December 1969, a COINTELPRO operation by the FBI broke into the headquarters of the Illinois chapter of the Black Panther Party. The arms raid culminated with the assassination of Fred Hampton, the group's deputy chairman. The FBI's tactics and subsequent cover-up were seen as proof that they tried to silence a prominent black leader. And Fred Hampton was uh, drugged by an informant and was assassinated. COINTELPRO is not over, it's just under a different uh, 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 name now. Mm -hmm. It's BIE. Well, this black identity extremist will be able to label. Coincidentally, Rakim even posted about the leaked assessment on his Facebook page on October 20th. Don't be surprised when them Homeland Security vans pull up. Eight weeks later, his home was raided. But now that he's out, Rakim was ready to resume Guerrilla Mainframe's objectives, including open carry patrols. Oh, so that's the AR-15, pretty uh, notorious weapon. Yeah, yeah, it has a lot of history to it. So we're in Dallas, Texas right now, which is, of course, open carry. Why is that so important in, as a part of your organization and Guerrilla Mainframe to open carry? It's, it's just been a tool to use against protests, against police brutality, and getting the attention of the masses to um, promote um, this culture of self-defense. Do you believe that these guns could provide any more autonomy for African Americans to not be brutalized by police? It's definitely a deterrent. You know, somebody, who, an aggressor, uh, looks for victims. They're not looking for a fight. So if you own, you have a better chance if you, if you weren't on. So that's why we want to tell everybody, everybody to get on. You have a right to defend yourself. Do you believe that actually building relationships with police could benefit the community? No. Working with police, um, it, it does very little. You know, their job is to be reactionaries, not proactionaries, you know. Um, and that's what we do. We, uh, we believe in being proactive for the community. I feel like uh, we need to be uh, self-serving people to patrol our own communities and set up institutions where we can serve our people without the police in interference. So it looks like the cops are pulling up even down the street right now. What is your initial reaction when you see police officers? They're just an occupying force in our community. Yeah, I can tell you that by the numbers they came. So we got three cop cars currently. They like they come in this direction. So how many cops? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Put down, put down. Put down your fire alarm.
Okay. Yeah. Oh yeah, we're good to go. How you yeah. guys doing? Good, good. We're gonna take this. Keep away from me for a minute, okay? All right, good to go. Well, now we're secured. Yes, sir. We just got a call mm -hmm. from some neighbors saying that y'all out here with guns, so we're just checking it out. Relax. You guys gonna be out here for a while? Um. Probably just another like ten minutes or so. Ten minutes, okay. There's people around the neighborhood are just totally freaking out. Well, you know, you guys can post up nearby and, you know, just for their mind. Okay. There's nothing wrong with what you guys are doing. We just have to look into everything, you know. Oh, yeah, you know. So I hope you guys understand that, you know. Yeah, yeah we definitely understand. Okay. I appreciate y'all's y'all cooperation. Cool. All right. Good to go. We'll leave it right there, and then you, once we go away, you guys do whatever you want. All right. Thanks. Definitely intimidating, not gonna lie. I can say that we were lucky that, you know, camera was around because if the camera was around, probably would have went a little bit different. As a result of exercising his First and Second Amendment rights, Rakim has become the unwitting poster child for black identity extremists. And although the charges were dropped, Rakim's arrest and jail time have thrown his life into upheaval. I have to take in consideration any and everything that I do that somebody is watching. In one moment, you know, my life was turned upside down. I lost, you know, my job. I lost my apartment. Most important, you know, I lost the innocence of my name. I can be easily Googled and I'll be, be seen as a potential terrorist. We reached out to the FBI about Rakim's case and they issued the following statement. The FBI may only initiate an investigation based upon information or allegations that an activity constitutes a federal crime or a threat to national security. The FBI cannot initiate an investigation based solely on an individual's race, ethnicity, national origin, religion, or the exercise of their constitutional rights, and we remain committed to protecting those rights for all Americans. But perhaps the most damaging effect of the FBI's Black Identity Extremist Assessment is what it could mean for any black activist. Does this essentially justify um, the violation of First Amendment rights? If this report is taken seriously, that it comes from the premier law enforcement agency in the land, it not only implicates your rights, it makes your exercise of your rights the indicator that they need to justify taking suppressive action against you. It's not just that we're disrupting him, but we're letting his group of protesters know that they are under the microscope and that what put them under the microscope was their political activity. Street, street, street. 